Hello again. Welcome to Jason Live. My name is Patrick Shea, and we're back once again with our STEM career series where we learn about careers in science, technology, engineering, and math from role models currently working in those fields. Today's role model is Dr. Katie Inderbitson. We're joined once again by Katie, who has graciously agreed to come back for another session after her September Live event was cut short. Uh, Katie is a geochemist, and she's also a former Jason Argonaut. We're going to get back to our conversation with Katie in just a moment. But first, I want to remind all of you out there that this event is live and interactive. Use the box just below the video window to send us questions and participate in our polls. We'll try to get as many of you involved as possible. But right now, it's time to welcome Katie back. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me again. It's great. So um, last time we talked a lot about your current research, your current projects. We're going to talk a little bit about that again, but I encourage everybody out there, if you didn't see that uh, fascinating 10 minutes of the beginning of our program last time, go and check that out. Um, but let's start with the basics, Katie. Why don't you tell us what a geochemist is and what you do? So a geochemist, uh, so I'm more specifically a hydrothermal geochemist, so I'm really interested in the chemistry that, uh, of the fluids that interact with the rocks in the crust underneath the ocean. And so this is a great picture. You can see kind of uh, water from inside the crust comes out, and uh, in the process of uh, circulating around in the crust, the uh, seawater changes a lot. It doesn't look like seawater anymore. It looks more like um, a very metal rich fluid. And so I'm really interested in those changes. And I'm also really interested in how exactly fluid circulates inside the ocean crust. We think it's a huge aquifer, but we're not really sure. So we're trying to figure out uh, and quantify uh, some of the flow patterns and things that are going on. Very cool. So uh, we have a, our first question of the day. This is from Elijah. He wants to know, what project are you working on right now? Uh, well, I'm actually working on several projects right now. Um, if you want to know more about my project on the Juan de Fuca Ridge, you should check out our video from uh, September. Um, but we're actually getting uh, ready to go on another cruise in December, which is going to be very exciting. We're going to um, an area just off the coast of Costa Rica, and uh, we're going to be investigating fluid flow between two little seamounts that poke through a big sediment blanket. Uh, and we don't really know a lot about that area. So the entire expedition is going to be completely new discoveries. And um, I'm getting really excited about it because we leave in just about a month. So it's going to be a really, really fun cruise. Cool. Uh, this next question from Maya Yer. Uh, I think this was probably related to the Juan de Fuca expedition, but it can certainly relate to pretty much any of your projects. What do you do when you get there? And once you get samples, what do you do with the samples? Well, that's, a, that's actually a really important question. So what do we do when we get down there? Well, the first thing we have to do is obviously collect the samples. And um, what we use on the Juan de Fuca Ridge are something called corks. And basically what we do is we go out with a drill ship and we drill a hole and we put in a long-term observatory that allows us to monitor the background state of things going on inside the crust. And we can monitor chemistry and fluid pressure, and we can even deploy microbiological experiments to see what kind of bugs live in these fluids. So, uh, so we use these things, and so when we collect our samples, we bring them back up to the surface, and then we can analyze our fluid samples uh, for what the chemistry looks like. And Based on what the chemistry looks like, we can figure out how the fluid is flowing, how it's changed over time, um, how it's been influenced by any microbes that are living in it, and any other things that might come up. This leads us to our next question. This one's from Joel. How do you get that deep in the ocean without getting crushed, which would really That's, ruin your yeah. day? That's super important. So we can use a number of methods to get that deep. Um, most recently, we used the ROV Jason, uh, which is a robot that's connected to the ship. And uh, basically, we deploy that over the side. And you can see it's got arms and it's got a, a basket in front that we can use to collect samples. And um, 
So that's one really, really cool thing that we can do. And Jason has a really long bottom time, uh, so we can get a lot of work done on each dive. Uh, another way that we can get to the bottom of the ocean is we can use Alvin, which is a human-occupied vehicle, uh, and it holds three people, one pilot and two scientists, and uh, you sit inside a titanium sphere that's about uh, two and a half, three inches thick, and uh, you fall, basically, you just use the, uh, you just use gravity, and we fall down to the bottom of the ocean, and uh, you can see that nice cutaway that has uh, some, you can see kind of how cozy it is inside. The, the sphere is only, well, the old sphere is only about six feet uh, in diameter on the inside, so three people gets a little cozy. You can see there's me on my first dive uh, with my colleague Bob, that's him in the middle, and our pilot Mark on the far right. So it's quite cozy. It's kind of like going on a road trip in a smart car with two people you might not know very well, and you can't get out for eight hours. So tell me about that, though. Is that difficult? Does the uh, the experience just out, you know, the pros of the experience outweigh the cons of the experience? Uh, I, I think definitely. I mean, I don't really think there are any cons, um, personally. Uh, some people, you know, aren't really into the lack of a bathroom um, for eight to ten hours. Uh, but, that you know, that's that's one of the things you have to deal with when you're working in the deep sea. Um one, one thing I have found is that if you dive with people you don't really know, uh, by the end of the dive, you tend to know them pretty well. And uh, you either know that you're going to get along with them very well, or you know that you don't get along with them very well. And I'm guessing that you plan, you're able to plan ahead for the bathroom situation. Yes. Yeah, there's a big sign in the galley, actually, on the Atlantis. And it says, pee before you go, just those letters. <laughs> <laughs> so it reminds everybody, before you go in the sub, what you need to do. Makes sense. We're going to shift gears uh, <laughs> a little bit here and take a question from Ms. Templin's class. She wants to know, or they want to know, what is the role of engineering and math in your research? Those are two super duper important fields in what I do. Uh, engineering Basically, all of the tools that we use from, you know, something as, simpler, as simple as a water sampling device all the way up to the Alvin, those things have to be designed by engineers. And so a lot of times when we want to do a certain kind of sampling or if we want to develop a new tool, you know, we'll kind of have an idea of what we want to do, but we'll have to go to some engineers and say, OK, is this actually going to work? Um, so we have to work very, very closely with um you know, engineers who are uh, involved in building instrumentation. Um, also, uh, math is really important for everybody, not for just the engineers that are building things for us, um, but also in what I do. Uh, for example, just the other day, uh, we were getting a, a procedure together. We're going to analyze phosphate in uh, some of the in some of the fluids we're going to be collecting in December, and we wanted to look at our standards and see if we could analyze over the range that we're expecting to see. And we do that using colorimetry. And in order to look at the absorption, we have to create a linear regression. And so if you've done anything with linear regression in math, where you, you know, find points and fit a line through those points, that's very basic math. And, you know, here we are doing very complex science with very, very basic math. So math is super duper important. So everybody keep learning math. Our next question is from Allison. Uh, you just alluded to this a little bit with the engineers, but she wants to know, do you have partners to help you in your research? I do. I'm very, very lucky that we have um, a very tight-knit group of folks that I've basically been working with for the last six or seven years. And uh, it's, it's really great. So we have folks not just on the engineering side, but other scientists as well. So um, my PhD work was actually in more of the geophysical end of things. So, um, so I work with some geophysicists. I work with my current boss, who's a geochemist. We have microbiologists that we collaborate with. Um, we also collaborate with educators. Um, we're going to have a couple teachers out on our cruise in December who will be developing curricula and uh, classroom projects uh, that they can then bring back to the classroom. Um, so we really try to keep a very interdisciplinary uh, group that works on these projects. And that's very important for actually getting funding from NSF. 
Our next question from a guest out there. Um, he wants to know, do the long-term stations interact with the rocks and does it mess up your research? You know, that's a really good question. So um, when we deploy these, these long-term observatories, um, the way we do it is we basically have to put a lot of metal casing down into the rocks. And so for some things, it doesn't really make a whole lot of difference. For like fluid pressure, that doesn't really matter so much. But for example, um, the microbiologists, if there's a whole lot of extra steel kicking around in their system and they want to sample the microbes that are, uh, that are eating things, they may not necessarily be getting a representative community because we've introduced this, you know, um, uh, this, this very different uh, metal that they're not used to. So what we've done with the, one of the newest generations of observatories is we've actually installed a coated fiberglass casing which is inert, which means that the microbes aren't really going to interact with it so much. So we're hoping that that at least will fix any microbiological issues that we might have had, uh, because when these things were initially designed, they weren't necessarily designed for microbiological sampling. Our next question is from Elizabeth. She wants to know, what's the most important thing you've encountered or discovered as a geochemist? Ooh, that's a really tough question. Um, Putting it in the spot. So, so uh, let's see. Most important thing. I mean, I think all of this is really important. So we know less about the bottom of the ocean than we do about the dark side of the moon and the surface of Mars. So even the small things that we discover, you know, even as recently, you know, we didn't even know hydrothermal vents existed until the late 1970s. And, you know, that's a very significant, uh, you know, and very exciting field that's uh, going on right now. Um, so, you know, basically just the development of everything in this field has really been super exciting. Me personally, it's a little early to say. I just really started my career about maybe a year and a half ago. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold off on saying anything that I've done has been significant. But I think the field in general of hydrothermal geochemistry has been, you know, phenomenally uh, exciting and uh, over the last, you know, certainly 20, 30 years. So I'm glad you bring that up, the fact that you've, you've just been in this particular role not mm -hmm. very long. Um, so you're, you're, you know, pretty young for doing what you do. And it hasn't been that long since you were, you know, maybe sitting in the same seat as our audience out there at the same age, thinking about what you wanted to do in the future. So let's uh, shift gears a little bit and talk about your career path. Um, mm -hmm. We have a bunch of questions, actually, that came in from a number of people, Gracie, Trinity, Emmy, Emma, Caitlin, Logan, and Gavin all had variations on these questions. What made you interested in what you do, and why did you choose to become a geochemist? Excellent question. And so when I was probably about the same age as a lot of you, when I was about 11, I was in middle school, and um, I, I, I think you guys still do those, the scholastic book orders or, you know, book fairs when you can go, you know, buy a whole bunch of books. Um, and so I saw this book that was written by uh, Bob Ballard, and uh, it was about the Titanic. And so I said, oh, that sounds kind of cool. I'll order that. And so I ordered that. And when I got it, it, and I opened it up and I was looking at the section about, you know, how he got to be an oceanographer and things like that. There was a picture of a hydrothermal vent chimney. And I saw that and I was like, wow, that is so cool. I need to study those. That's what I want to study. And so I went to the library and I just, I read books and, um, you know, found out how really we didn't know anything about them. And I was like, this, this is cool. This is what I want to do. And, um, and so that's kind of how it, it got me uh, started. And uh, I, my mom is actually a high school chemistry teacher. Um, and so I've always kind of had chemistry in my life. Um, and so geology was easy. I love rocks. Um, and with, uh, you know, combining my love of rocks and uh, chemistry and fluid and hydrothermal system in general, I couldn't go wrong with being a geochemist. We've got another, if I can make him come up here, we've got another uh, career path question.
question from a guest out there. How did your selection as a Jason Argo influence your future career? It was really, really pivotal for me. Um, so I was 14 and I uh, did, I was on Jason Argo for Jason 6, which was in Hawaii in 1995. And so that was quite a while ago. Um, but I got really excited when the call went out for applications because a couple years before I had seen an article in the Boston Globe about the Jason project and I had written to Bob asking for information about it. And um, I had gotten a whole bunch of stuff back and basically saying, oh, you're too young right now, but you should apply in a few years. So I did. And fortunately, the year I applied, um, they went to Hawaii and it was a phenomenal geology intensive um, uh, week of my life. And so I had never been to Hawaii before. I'd certainly never walked on an active volcano before. I'd never, you know, used a little scoop to pick up a, a sample of lava. It, it was a phenomenal experience for me. And so it really cemented um, what I what I really enjoyed about science and being out in the field and working with rocks and other scientists. And so that was kind of the first gateway into um, me becoming kind of a, a, a geology oriented person. So moving ahead in time just a little bit, this question uh, is from Davis, wants to know what kind of high school did you attend? Uh, was it a specialized science and technology school or a public high school? Uh, I went to public school uh, in southern New Hampshire. Um, I grew up in a town of about 30,000 people. Um, so not a huge town, um, but we only have one high school. And, uh, and it's where my mom teaches, actually. Uh, so I had her for chemistry, which was interesting. Um, <laughs> But very good. And uh, so, yeah, I just I went to public high school. But at the same time, I also really tried to explore my opportunities um, around in, in the summertime. I did um, uh, uh, an ocean going program one summer uh, through the Sea Education Association, which is out of Woods Hole. Um, and so I got to go to sea for about a week and experience what that was like and see if I liked being on a boat. Um, Things like that. So I, I did go just go to public high school, but I did have a lot of opportunities. Um, fortunately, we did have a good selection of AP classes and things like that. So was mom a, a tough grader? She was, but she was tougher on me than the, I think it was fair. She was tougher on me than the rest of the students. Well, it all worked out, obviously. Yes. Um, <laughs> we've got a couple of related questions that have come in. Again, moving a little beyond uh, high school people want to know about your college years these questions are from raquel and emily how many years did you spend in college to become a marine geologist and pretty much the same question how many years of college did you go through uh so i just spent four years doing a bachelor's at the university of miami i have a bachelor in science and geology and then i went to the university of california at santa barbara and got a master's in marine science and then I went back to the University of Miami because I decided I liked Miami a lot and uh, got a Ph.D. in marine geology and geophysics. And that took about six years. So if you add up all of that, that's about 14 years. So it's it's a long process, um, but it, it was worth it. Now, I would think a lot of people out there would get intimidated by, you know, all of that extra school beyond high school, beyond college. You know, and, and does it feel like you're waiting for your career to begin? Or do you feel like when you're doing those studies and in school that you've already really started? Well, especially when you get to grad school, you really kind of have, you have a proto career, I guess you could call it. Um, when you're in college, you're just taking classes. Um, but when you get to grad school, you really only take classes for like your first year or two. And then after that, you're just working on your research project. And, you know, maybe you sit in on some lectures that are relevant to what you're doing. Um, but like when I went back to Miami, uh, because I already had a master's, I think I had to take four classes. And then I was basically just working on my project for the next uh, four and a half years. So um, I basically felt like by the time I left that I already had a lot of the tools to be, you know, maybe not a chief scientist, but a primary investigator on a project because... I had been working on my project for so long. 
Okay, we've got one more question in this section here. This is another one from Ms. Templin's class. They keep an interactive science notebook in their class. Uh, did you have to do this when you were in school? And if so, did it help you understand science better and help you in your work today? Oh, I've never heard of this before. Uh, I'd be interested to know more about it. Um, I, I, I don't remember. I remember we used to have to write article summaries on current events that were happening in science for some of our science classes. So you'd have to go to the library because we didn't have the internet back then. Um, so you'd have to go to the library and look at some science magazines and find an article about something that was going on and you'd have to write about it. And it was to keep everybody kind of up on current trends in science. Um, but I'd be curious to hear more about this uh, interactive science workbook. That might be something I could disseminate to some of my teacher friends. Cool. So if Ms. Templin's class is listening out there, write us and explain some more about what you do with your interactive science notebook. Okay, um, we're going to change gears for a minute here. You've been asking Katie a lot of questions. Now it's her turn to ask you some poll questions. Here's our first one. Um, Katie has dived to the seafloor in multiple submersible vehicles. Um, has she dived in the Shinkai, in Alvin, or in Jason? Tricky. What do you think, Katie? Is this a <laughs> trick question? It's a little bit of a trick question because I didn't talk about the Shinkai. Yeah. Is it fair to say there are two correct answers and one wrong answer here? Well, the, well, I mean, it depends on has dived as in me physically or theoretically. Okay. So there's <laughs> only one correct answer. Uh, we're getting a mix. You've talked a little bit about Alvin. Alvin is in the lead at the moment with almost 80%. Uh, so why don't you tell us the right answer here? The right answer is B, Alvin. B, Alvin. And what is the Shinkai? The Shinkai is the Japanese uh, submersible that they use to do research. And they, uh, I forget what it's named for, but uh, it's called the Shinkai 6500. And it can go down to 6,500 meters. But I have not dived in it. And why was this a little bit of a trick question? Uh, so it was a little bit of a trick question because if you think about it, technically I've been to the seafloor with Jason, but I wasn't on Jason or in Jason. I just stand up on the ship in the control room and watch the robot cameras as they look around. So technically I've been to the seafloor with Jason, but not physically. Gotcha. <laughs> Here's our next ooh, our next poll question. Katie wants to know what you think a scientist usually looks like. Is it A, a guy in a lab coat with crazy hair? Is it B, a woman in a suit? Or is it C, anyone and everyone? And I think we can safely say there is only think. one correct answer for this one. <laughs> and it might be kind of obvious. We've got answers coming in. 92% at the moment think it's C. What's the right answer, Katie? The right answer is C. Hooray! I'm so <laughs> glad you guys all got that. They're getting the message. So we're going to move right ahead to our last poll question. When Katie is not doing science, she is A, enjoying creative things like sewing and singing, B, enjoying outdoor activities like hiking and kayaking, or C, both of the above. So this is actually going to lead us into our next segment here. We're going to talk about some of the things that Katie does when she is not working. Um, we've got answers coming in. Let's see. There is a... a about 90% are thinking it's both of the above. And that is exactly right. Both of the above. I do all kinds of stuff when I'm not being a scientist. So tell us about that. What kind of stuff do you do? Um, so, well, we, we touched a, a little bit on, uh, well, in that question, actually. So sorry about that, guys. My uh, Skype crashed. 
Katie, what is it with uh, our events? We just have such bad <laughs> luck with technology while we try to connect and, and do this thing. Thank you for calling back. I hope we didn't lose any of our audience out there. Um, what were we talking about, Katie? <laughs> I've lost uh, my we train of thought. We were talking about what I do uh, when I'm not being a scientist. That's exactly what we were talking about. So you were just going to tell us, I think, about some of the outdoor activities and some of the creative things that you do when you're not doing your research. Yes. So um, I really like to use both halves of my brain. So the science side uses one half. And I really, really enjoy doing super, super creative things. So I've uh, sung for a very, very long time. I love to go to karaoke um, and sing in organized groups and things like that. Um, but I'm also a seamstress. I've been sewing for, oh, I don't know, a while now, you know, probably since the late 90s. And, um, and so I make costumes uh, based on movies and uh, TV and history and uh, comics. Um, and I like to, you know, wear these to sci-fi conventions and things like that. So, uh, so you can see actually that costume on the left there is my Captain Hook costume. I'll be putting that on later today because it is Halloween. And Halloween is like my favorite holiday of the year because you get to dress up. And, uh, and you can see I've also been prominent scientist before. I was Dr. Crusher uh, from Star Trek The Next Generation, which some of you teachers and older folks out there probably remember. So give me kind of a, a time spent on this kind of activity, because those are very elaborate costumes. They must take forever to create. It, they do. So I've done a lot less since I finished my PhD um, while I was working on my on my degree, I was a little bit more flexible with time. Um, but for example, the um, something simple like Captain Hook, uh, like parts of it I could get at the thrift store. Like I got the black pants at the thrift store and I just had to make the shirt and the vest. And that probably took about maybe a week of on and off work uh, if I work on it a couple hours a night. Um, but something complicated like the big red poofy dress, the Marie Antoinette gown, that took probably four to five months because I made all of the undergarments, the hoop skirt, the corset. Um, I styled the wig. Um, it was very, very complicated and there's a lot of parts. So that took a really long time, but I haven't done anything that complicated recently. So we've got a question here about your outdoor activities. Isaiah says that he kayaks a lot. And does this kind of activity influence your job at all? Maybe not directly, but it does allow me to clear my head. So um, I'd never really done a lot of kayaking until maybe the last year. I think I had done some in Girl Scouts. And um, I recently got introduced to uh, sea kayaking, which is a lot of fun. And it's really cool to go out in, you know, in the bay where the otters are playing. And it's just kind of nice to get out of the office and get out into the fresh air. And uh, sometimes when you're paddling around, you might get some new idea for a grant or uh, something you'd like to check out in your own data that you already have. Um, and that's the great part about science is that you could be anywhere like here at the Grand Canyon and, you know, just walking around and experiencing beautiful scenery and nature. And it's just so cleansing to your brain that you can get new ideas. And so that's what I really enjoy about, enjoy about um, being outdoors. All right, Katie, we're getting towards the end of our time here, so we're going to go rapid fire with a bunch of questions okay. right now. This one's from Kelsey. Do you know any foreign languages? I do. I, uh, I'm, my Spanish is a little bad now because I don't use it very often, uh, but I do also speak Japanese. Very impressive. Victoria and Luisa want to know, did you ever want to be something besides a geochemist? When I was really little, I thought I wanted to be a medical doctor because my dad works in a blood bank. Um, but then I discovered that I don't really do well at the sight of blood. So <laughs> that kind of killed that one. There it goes. Uh, Michaela wants to know, are you good friends with your coworkers? And are any of them watching right now to find out one way or the other? <laughs> <laughs> Some of them might be, I think. Hi, guys. Um, <laughs> I, I do get along with my coworkers, and I think I'm really lucky that I have such a great group of colleagues uh, that I work with. Isaiah wants to know, what do you like to sing about? 
I like to sing about pretty much everything. Um, you know, classic 80s songs, um, you know, heartbreaking country songs. It's all fun. Okay. What was your favorite year in school counting college? That question comes from Noah. Ooh, that's, that's a really tough question. Um, I would probably have to say maybe my junior or senior year of college, which was when I really got into all of the um, field-based and hardcore geology classes. Um, and I was taking like all of them at the same time. And it was just like every day I would walk into class and my brain would explode from something phenomenal that we would talk about. And so I'd have to say probably then. Pretty cool. Emily and Olivia both wanted to know, how does your job affect us and people in general? Why are geochemists important? Well, geochemists in general don't just do hydrothermal work. They also, my, my aunt actually does some geochemistry. She works for the EPA in Ohio. Um, and so a lot of geochemists look at things like groundwater and um, you know quality of water, things like that. And that's really important. Um, geochemists are also important in a hydrothermal sense because we're trying to figure out how the hydrothermal system as a fluid flow through fits into the global water cycle because we really don't know. And, um, and if we don't understand the entire water cycle, that has a lot of implications for climate change, um, for you know how long are we going to be able to have fresh water kicking around on this planet? What's the quality of the sea going to be like? things like that. So it, it really has a big effect on human nature in general. Well, it sounds like you've inspired some of our viewers out there. Teresa awesome. and Peyton want to know what you have to do to get into your field and what's the most important thing to study if you want to become a geochemist. So if you want to get into this kind of field, um, definitely take a lot of science and math classes. Um, if you're, you know, if you're in high school, if you have the opportunity to take like uh, an advanced placement chemistry or advanced placement biology or earth science, something like that. Um, the great thing about geochemistry is you can really get into it from a number of different fields. So I came originally from geology. I know some people who come from chemistry, who come from math. Um, so you can really get into it from a variety of different levels. But the most important thing is to get a lot of science and a lot of math and actually also writing because what one thing you do a lot as a scientist is you write you write grants you write papers to talk about your research um so you're writing all the time so if if you're not a good writer you're going to struggle so definitely hone up on those writing skills okay these are our last two questions of the day uh, the first is from Elizabeth, who wants to know what the scariest thing that's happened to you as a geochemist. And the other is from Michaela, who wants to know what's the funniest encounter you've had as a geochemist. Hmm. I don't think I've actually had anything scary happen to me. I mean, scary, uh, maybe at one point recently, somebody called me an expert on the area that I'm working in. <laughs> And that was kind of scary because I'm like, I'm, I'm too young to be an expert. This, this is not right. So that was a little terrifying, but probably not in the way that you mean. Um, the funniest thing. Um, well, sometimes when we bring stuff up from hydrothermal vents, they smell really bad because there's a lot of hydrogen sulfide in some of these systems. So sometimes when the biologists will bring up, you know, animals or things like that, and they'll, they'll just smell awful and everybody always blames it on the chemists they always say oh the chemists are making something with hydrogen sulfide no 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 it was the biologist <laughs> well we're gonna end it on that note because we've run out of time blame it on the biologists everybody <laughs> out there go out there and learn how to be a geochemist because clearly it's making katie very happy so maybe it's it'll awesome. make you happy as well uh, Katie, thanks for joining us again today, and uh, really appreciate you sharing your story with our audience. Well, thanks for having me. Awesome. Um, that's all the time we have with Katie, but if you've enjoyed this event, we have uh, another one coming up next week, and that is not it. That's it. Uh, 
we're going to connect with Kevin Lino. He is a coral reef biologist. He works with NOAA's Coral Reef Ecosystem Division, and he has a fascinating job. He's got lots of interesting stories, including one where he gets stranded on a desert, a deserted island. Uh, so you don't want to miss that. We'll be live with Kevin next Thursday at 1.30 p.m. Eastern. So uh, that's all the time we have. Once again, my name is Patrick Shea from Jason Learning, and we'll see you next time. Take care. Mm -hmm.